Hi everyone, today we're going to be going over the Cenozoic Era. So like all the other time interval lectures we've done, I start by showing you this timeline to remind you where we're at now in geologic history. We started with the Precambrian, which goes from the Hadean to the Archean to the Proterozoic. Then we went to the Paleozoic Era. Last we did the Mesozoic, and now we're finally at the Cenozoic Era. This is the most recent era in Earth's history and is still going on right now. And that is why I put humans as the main event for this era. However, there are a lot of other things that went on during this era early on and are still going on now, and we're going to go over some major geologic and biological events that occurred in the Cenozoic. First, to start with geological events, we can look at the evolution of Cenozoic paleogeography, or the movement of the continents. We left off in the Cretaceous, the last period of the Mesozoic, with the continents almost in their current configuration, except India was still moving up to collide with Asia and hadn't done so yet, and Australia and Antarctica were still kind of locked together and hadn't really separated much yet. So these were the main two movements, but basically the configuration of continents finalized itself during the Cenozoic. So now let's look at what's happening at the surface throughout the Cenozoic and how it led to our current tectonic situation throughout the globe, as well as the current mountain belts that we have at our surface today. So here's the current configuration of lithospheric plates on Earth today and where they are colliding with each other. During the Cenozoic, most of the world's geologic features were formed or are still being formed, including the Himalayas, the Alps, the Andes, the San Andreas Fault, the Grand Canyon, and the North American Rocky Mountains. To start with, we're going to talk about the tectonics that were occurring at the Cordilleran Mobile Belt throughout the Cenozoic and what's occurring now at that mobile belt. We talked about how the Cordilleran Mobile Belt is at the western margin of the U.S. And in the last video over the Mesozoic, we talked about how the Nevadan and Severe orogenies occurred in the Mesozoic. And we talked about how the Laramide orogeny began in the Mesozoic, but then continued until the Eocene. The Laramide orogeny was the last major orogenic event contributing to the development of the Cordilleran mobile belts before a change in stress occurred. Basically, the Laramide orogeny was the subduction of the Farallon Plate, an oceanic slab that subducted under North America at a very shallow angle, causing deformation further inland of the trench. And then by the Eocene, the subduction got to the point where the mid-ocean ridge of the Farallon Plate had reached the trench. However, that was the point at which subduction ceased. And this is because the mid-ocean ridge wasn't dense enough to subduct, and therefore the stress changed from compressional to shear. And that was because transform motion began causing the San Andreas Fault instead of continuing compressional subduction. And currently, today, the remnants of the Farallon Plate that hadn't subducted yet, called the Juan de Fuca Plate and the Couscous Plate, are still subducting under North America as seen in this map. However, the shift in stress regime in the Eocene did cause a lot more that I want to talk about before we move on to more recent events. So let's talk about the basin and range deformation. During the Eocene, when the transition of compressional to shear stress began, the stress further inland throughout Western North America became extensional. And this caused basin and range deformation. Basically, all the compressional deformation that had occurred further inland due to the Farallon plate subduction at a low angle, that had just switched from compressional to extensional, causing all the compressional fold and thrust deformation to become basin and range deformation, where extensional normal faulting and horsts and grobbins formed. Horsts and grobbins are basically, in this lower picture, we can see that the grobbins are dropped down blocks due to normal faults on either side of the Graben, and forests are the blocks that don't drop down or are even uplifted in some cases. So along with the extension during this time and in this area, we also had rifting occur in North America. However, these two specific instances I'll be talking about were much later. For example, the Rio Grande rift began around 5 to 10 million years ago, and this rifting is shown in the right picture where we have the yellow blobs, and then we have the Rio Grande River in the Rift Valley. We also had around the same time as this rift, the rifting between Baja 
Baja California and Mexico causing the Gulf of California to open up, which is shown here. So moving on to orogenic activity outside of North America, this is a map showing in purple the Alpine and Himalayan mobile belts, the Cordilleran mobile belt, and the Andean mobile belt. We just talked about the Cordilleran mobile belt and the deformation it caused in North America during the Cenozoic. However, let's now turn our attention to outside of North America, for example, the Himalayan, the Alpine, and the Andean orogenies. The Himalayan orogeny began around the Eocene when India collided with Asia and is continued today as India continues to push toward Asia. The Alpine orogeny also began by the Eocene as Africa began colliding with Europe, closing the Tethys Sea and forming the Mediterranean, Black, and Caspian Seas. If you don't remember what the Tethys Sea was, remember when we went over the continental configurations during the Mesozoic, right after Pangaea formed during the latest Paleozoic, we had Pangaea break up back into Laurasia and Gondwana land, forming the Tethys Sea in between these two continental masses. And this Tethys Sea remained in between Europe and Africa until Africa closed that gap, and the remnants of the Tethys Sea are the Mediterranean, Black, and Caspian Seas. Now, the Andean orogeny is caused by the subduction of the Nazca Plate under South America and continues today as well. And another thing that all of the ocean continent subduction zones are famous for on Earth today is something called the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire is defined by strong earthquakes and intense volcanic activity that occurs along ocean continent subduction zones along the margins of the Pacific Ocean. Now to just give a brief summary of the geologic events that we just discussed, let's put them all along the timeline of the Cenozoic era. The Cenozoic era has epochs, Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and Holocene, and these epochs go from 65 million years ago at, at the end of the Mesozoic to now at the end of the Holocene at zero million years ago as we are in the Holocene currently. So going from right to left, we have the Andean orogeny beginning in the earliest Paleocene, the Ring of Fire also beginning to form around this time as well due to subduction zones such as the Andean, the Himalayan orogeny beginning in the Eocene, the Laramide orogeny ending in the Eocene, remember it started in the late Mesozoic, the Alpine orogeny beginning also in the Eocene, the San Andreas Fault forming due to the end of the Laramide subduction and beginning of shear stress, the beginning of the Basin and Range extension, the beginning of Central America subduction, the beginning of the Rio Grande Rift Zone, and the Ring of Fire, the Himalayas, the Alps, the San Andreas, and the Basin and Range continue in their orogenic activity today. So now before we get to the biological events that occurred in the Cenozoic, let's just talk about the climate a little bit. The climate in the Cenozoic began pretty hot and the Paleocene Eocene boundary is marked by a thermal maximum meaning a really hot period around 55 million years ago however the rest of the Cenozoic era up until today has been marked by pretty intense cooling associated with continental fragmentation and then we had our most recent ice age happening around 2.6 million years ago in the Pleistocene and ever since then, things have been warming up again. And now, of course, we're adding on to that. But besides that, these are the transitions of the Cenozoic in terms of climate. We have the Eocene warm period with high sea level. We have the Pleistocene way later with the Ice Age. And now we have the present with ice caps, but more temperate temperatures and sea level throughout most of the globe. Now, moving to Cenozoic life. The Cenozoic is referred to in terms of vertebrates as the age of mammals and can also be referred to in terms of of invertebrates as the age of insects. These are the two main dominant types of organisms for vertebrates and invertebrates, respectively. And so now let's talk about the events that occurred evolutionarily and biologically for the marine invertebrates, the terrestrial invertebrates, the marine vertebrates, the terrestrial vertebrates, and then the plants. So starting with the marine invertebrates, we had the modern forms of bivalves, such as clams, oysters, and scallops evolve. We had gastropods expand to inhabit practically every single marine animal and terrestrial environment, and gastropods also represent the second most abundant invertebrate during the entire Cenozoic, second right behind arthropods. And then we had scleractinian and corals. After the rudest wind extinct, scleractinian and corals were able to become the major reef builders again, and ever since then have been dominating reef building and reef communities in marine environments. And then we also have 
calcareous microplankton. We talked about coccolithophores in the Mesozoic being dominant in the Cretaceous and causing the Cretaceous to be named after the rock they form, which is chalk, and in Latin that is creta. However, in the Cenozoic, coccolithophores were no longer dominant. Actually, the dominant forms of calcareous plankton were diatoms, dinoflagellants, and foraminifera. These are just other groups of microorganisms that grow their skeletons or tests or shells, whatever you want to call it, with calcium carbonate. Then we also have echinoids such as sand dollars and sea urchins diversify in Cenozoic. And then we had marine arthropods. And arthropods in the ocean, you might think about lobsters and shrimp, but they were much more than this. The most common Cenozoic forms are annelid worms, which are not preserved as body fossils, but are preserved most often as trace fossils, forming tracks and burrows in the sediment. So now let's move on to terrestrial invertebrates, which we already mentioned at the beginning of the Cenozoic life slide, that arthropods, such as insects, were dominant and remain dominant throughout the Cenozoic. And I just realized that this slide says dominant vertebrates. Pretend like that says invertebrates. <laughs> arthropods are not vertebrates. So insects are the most successful in the Cenozoic, but arachnids, such as spiders and scorpions, are also very abundant. So moving on to marine vertebrates now, we have most of the fish in the Cenozoic being bony fish. However, some cartilaginous fish, such as sharks, remain abundant and continue to remain abundant today. There is one difference in today's sharks than in, for example, the Eocene sharks. During the Eocene, sharks with jaws more than six feet across had evolved, and these were called Carcharodon, Megalodon, and I'm sure you all have heard of Megalodon fish. Thankfully, they are now extinct. My goodness, that would be terrifying. Now, regarding marine reptiles, we talk in the Mesozoic about marine reptiles that resemble today's marine mammals. However, after the KT extinction, only a few marine reptiles had survived, and these went on to become things that we know in the modern day to be sea turtles and sea snakes. And therefore, the niche that had been filled by Mesozoic marine reptiles could now be filled by marine mammals. So that brings us to the next slide of marine invertebrates, which is cetacean evolution. Cetaceans are just marine mammals like whales, dolphins, and other porpoises. And during the Eocene, whales evolved, and during the Miocene, dolphins evolved. And it's just kind of crazy to think that mammals had evolved from fish that had learned to walk on land and become tetrapods. And then millions of years later, mammals that had become primed to walk on land decided to go back into the ocean and become marine mammals. And this diagram shows the example of whales, which started from animals such as Pachycetus, which is this first picture here, a land tetrapod that looked somewhat like this, evolved into each one of these stages of whale evolution before becoming what we know today as humpback whales. And there's obviously a lot more intermediate stages in between each one of these major stages, but it's just crazy how much we have in the way of whale preservation and all the stages that point to this, which seems like the most unlikely pathway, but it is, and it's so cool. So moving on to terrestrial vertebrates, like we said earlier, mammals were dominant, and that's why the Cenozoic is sometimes referred to as the age of mammals. However, mammals were still small and rodent-like by the end of the Mesozoic, in the beginning of the Cenozoic. However, by the end of the Eocene, they had greatly diversified, and this is largely because of the fragmentation of continents, causing more geographical isolation and therefore more species. So the four main mammal groups we will go over in this lecture include marsupials, primates, ungulates, and carnivores. First, marsupials and monotremes, which are just mammals that give birth to really underdeveloped young and then raise it in a pouch. These were the only two mammalian groups to migrate to the southern continents before they fragmented. And this meant that in Australia, marsupials and monotremes diversified and became dominant and still remain dominant. And by the Pliocene, North and South America had been joined by the Panama land bridge, allowing South American marsupials, such as possums, to migrate north. And now possums are the most successful marsupial in North America. Moving on to primates, primates had evolved by the latest Cretaceous and the late Mesozoic, and by the Paleocene and the early Cenozoic, primates had inhabited both North America and Europe, and they resembled lemurs. However, by the Eocene, primates had evolved into Old World monkeys in Africa and New World monkeys in South America, 
which are just the terms we use to describe these two physiologically different groups of primates. The old and new has nothing to do with time. But regarding great apes, chimpanzees, and humans, we all evolved from a common ancestor with old world monkeys. Moving on to ungulates, ungulates are just placental hooved herbivores. These evolved by the Eocene, and the appearance of grasses in the Miocene allowed grazers such as deer, horses, and cows to evolve. Regarding carnivores, such as dogs, cats, bears, etc., these evolved by the Paleocene, so very early in the Cenozoic, and remained small to medium-sized until the Pleistocene. So throughout most of the Cenozoic, these were small to medium-sized. However, by the Pleistocene, a lot of things got mega-sized, including not only some of these carnivores, but also some of the herbivores we were just talking about. They evolved into giant forms in the Pleistocene due to cooler temperatures. And this is because large bodies have smaller surface area per volume and can more easily conserve heat. And a couple examples of some of these megafaunas include things like mammoths and giant ground sloths. But unfortunately, many of these giant Pleistocene mammals became extinct by the end of the Pleistocene. And it's debated among researchers whether this is due to hunting by early man or whether this is due to rapid climate change and vegetation change that had occurred at the end of the Pleistocene. So moving on to plants, we have angiosperms or flowering plants that we talked about last time in the Mesozoic video evolving in the Cretaceous. They then went on in the Cenozoic to become the dominant type of terrestrial plant. And along with that, they did a lot to contribute to the evolution of pollinating insects. And then in the Miocene, grasses began to expand and cover vast plains of all continents. And the rise in grasses, like I mentioned earlier, co-varied with the rise in grazing animals because they have a mutually beneficial relationship. So to give you the paleontological summary of what happened in biological evolution during the Cenozoic, we have the first primates evolve in the Paleocene. We have large flightless carnivorous birds evolve in the Paleocene. Then we have ungulates and cetaceans evolving in the Eocene. Remember, ungulates are placental hoofed mammals and cetaceans are marine mammals such as dolphins and whales. We have old world monkeys evolving in the beginning of the Oligocene. We have new world monkeys evolved in the Oligocene as well. Then we have large sharks such as Megalodon during the Middle Cenozoic. Then we have songbirds evolve. We have grasses and grazing ungulates expand covariantly. We have the first hominins in the Pliocene. And then mega mammals evolve in the Pleistocene like we talked about with the cooler temperatures. And then we seem to be ending every era video, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic with a mass extinction. This is still under development, but it is largely confirmed that we are living in the beginning of the sixth mass extinction. But thankfully, I'm not getting into that in this video. This is just to mention the major events of the Cenozoic, and we have done that. So with that, thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful and you learned something about the geologic and biological history of the Cenozoic, and I can't wait to see you all next time. Bye!